I'm Richard Bolstad. I'm an NLP trainer. And usually most of my work involves traveling around the world in places where there are major social crises. So that would be things like uh, a tsunami or an earthquake in Japan or New Zealand, say, or in the Pacific Islands. Or on the other hand, a war in Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, in uh, the Caucasus, uh, where I was teaching in Piatigorsk, um, in uh, areas where there has been a, a military takeover and a massacre of civilians. Uh, so there, there are lots of um, places like this where I've worked over the last 30 years. And one of the one of the realizations that I've had over the last year uh, is that most of what we're doing with our trauma recovery processes in NLP is kind of like putting an ambulance at the bottom of a cliff because the causes of all these uh, traumatic events that I'm helping people to recover from are not generally their individual decisions. So this is challenging a, a very basic idea in NLP that each person is kind of in charge of their own brain and therefore they're in charge of the results they get. And that of course is, is an exaggeration. Uh, each person is in charge of the responses that they make and part of how they respond is the way that they were brought up, the way their parents responded, uh, which is encoded epigenetically in their body. Um, we know that, that people who, whose grandparents went through the Holocaust uh, are changed epigenetically as a result of what happened to their grandparents. People who went through a famine, uh, like the, um, the Holodomor in uh, Ukraine, they are changed as a result of uh, what their grandparents suffered. So, of course, what we're really doing is just fixing up things that are way after the real causes. And it seemed to me and my partner, Yulia, that it would be very important for us at this time in history to develop processes that focus on the collective origin of trauma. So processes that actually confront the fact that um, these huge uh, imperialist movements of, of history of uh, uh, like the American invasion of Vietnam, for example, the, uh, the Nazi uh, invasion of Europe with Stalin um, and, and uh, what's going on in Ukraine right now. Uh, these, these kinds of things are collective trauma and we need a collective oriented trauma process to have any effect and to stop this being transmitted from generation to generation. When, when people have a, a collective traumatization, they, they don't even identify it individually because they, they think it's normal. They look around and they see that everyone else has the same trauma as them, and they think of it as being the human condition, that war is just part of the way that the world is, uh, that the extermination of whole peoples and the invasion of countries is, is just kind of normal. So my uh, interest has been to develop this process and this process that I'm going to uh, guide you through that I'm going to share with you uh, actually came to my partner Yulia Kurosheva um, and she was looking for a solution to an individual challenge that she had at that time. So that's that, that means we didn't sit down and plan it together. It, it just kind of uh, came to her. And she's in a pretty um, important position right now because, of course, she, uh, she has family in both Russia and Ukraine. And uh, we've been working for the last few months with, um, with uh, traumatized people and, and with uh, psychologists, psychotherapists across Ukraine and across Eastern Europe as, as we deal with the um, with the building Third World War. So what we are, um, what we're about to do just, just came to her as a kind of a, an inspiration, I guess, from her unconscious uh, processing of all of this uh, stuff that's going on. And in this process, like most NLP processes, I invite you to begin by choosing some behavior, some response, uh, some emotion that you have in particular situations that you're not at peace with. So uh, maybe there are situations where you get anxious 
and you think, well, this isn't helping, you know, I wish I wasn't lying awake at night thinking about this. Maybe you get angry, uh, maybe you uh, insult people or criticize people, maybe you uh, don't actually say what's true for you in a situation. Something that you do, some way that you respond that you don't feel right with. Now, if you, if you don't feel right with it, then of course that suggests that you're not choosing to do it right now. And that means it comes from an earlier situation in your life. That's something that we kind of understand in NLP, of course. And so when you think about that, what I'd like you to do next, what I'm going to get you to do next is, we're not doing this yet, but I'm explaining. What I'm going to get you to do next is to identify when is the first time that you responded like this? When is the first time that you had this, um, this feeling or, or you behaved in this way? Another way of thinking about when is the first time is to think, how old does this part of me seem to be? You know, like, is this the way an adult behaves or, or is this the way a five-year-old behaves or, or a three-year-old? Um, how old is this part of me? And that gives you a clue when in your life this response began because it was probably quite a bit more appropriate at that age. It, it made sense at that age. But now it, it's kind of out of date. And that's not to criticize it. It was a good idea at the time, the best idea you had. And this is really, really important in this whole process that I'm doing, this whole collective recovery process, which uh, Yulia uh, calls transcendence. It's really, really important to, to understand that we're not blaming. And on the other hand, we're not excusing. We're not trying to pretend it's not happening. Uh, so when people are traumatized, they, they lie to themselves. They, they cover up what's happened. And the reason is because they're afraid that it's their fault somehow, or it's their parents' fault, or it's their country's fault, something like that. And that way of thinking whose fault is it is not an NLP way of thinking. It doesn't make sense. Um, and, and this process shows why it doesn't make sense. Because first of all, we realize that the, the way you behave at present there's no point in criticizing it because it comes from the way that you behaved much earlier in your life. It's part of a larger sphere of ways you've been responding through your life since that original event. Now, when you think back to that event, the next thing to think about is going to be who, who was there. Because you, you didn't just make up this way of responding by yourself. You, you had to learn what ways of responding do people do. And you learn that from your parents, other significant people early in your life. So at that point, I'm encouraging you to think who else would have been there when you first felt this way, when you first had this response, usually maybe one of your parents. It may be that this conflict that you feel inside you now between you and the way that you respond actually parallels the conflict that you had between you and your parent, or it parallels the conflict that you saw other people having maybe your parent and, and someone else, maybe the two of your parents early in your life. So what we're going to do is, is get you to notice that the way that you respond makes sense in the wider system of you being there with that other person. And the way they respond makes sense in terms of their family of origin, where they came from. Because that, they, they were limited as well in their beliefs and their uh, values and their ideas about what was possible, they were limited by the family that they came from. So what, I'd, what I'm going to, at that point in the process, I'm going to encourage you to do is to notice that instead of blaming them, your parent, for example, instead of excusing them and, and saying, well, you know, like, uh, maybe it was good in the long run, something, instead of doing either of those, you're just going to notice, okay, they responded as part of a system, what was happening in their family. And then I'm going to ask you to notice that their family was responding to the wider community around them, the people they went to work with, people they went to uh, church, mosque, synagogue, uh, uh, temple, or uh, to, to clubs and organizations they belong to, all those people they met at the shops, they worked with in the factory or in the office, on the farm, those, those people in the community around them that system makes sense of the way that that family was behaving, of course, otherwise they would have been rejected by that whole community. So, uh, so their behavior makes sense in that wider system. Now that community 
their behavior makes sense in the wider system as well, because it, it makes sense in terms of the whole culture uh, that they came from, you know, the, uh, the language that they used, the way of thinking that they had, the belief system, the faith. Um, if they had a, a faith in that community that was, that was kind of dominant, um, including like a, a, not just a religious faith, but uh, kind of, a, uh, for example, a belief in the West, some people would say, I'm not religious, but I, I believe in capitalism, you know, or, or people might say, I'm not religious, but I, I uh, believe in the eventual future of communism, something like that. So what you're doing is you, you're thinking, okay, that community makes sense in terms of that wider culture. And that's not criticizing and blaming the culture, and it's not excusing the community or something. It's just noticing that's the system. And then we expand further and we realize, well, that, that culture makes sense in terms of the country and the whole actual civilization around um, at that time. And of course, uh, the things that they were hearing on television or radio, the things that they were reading in newspapers, the way that their whole country was at that time, the values and beliefs and the limitations. Probably this is, we're thinking now back to a time when not many people could go to an NLP practitioner and do trauma recovery processes or something. So what they had at the time allows you to understand, okay, that's how come that was going on in the country, that's how come the community was behaving that way. They had their own worries, their own concerns, maybe uh, they didn't have the economic choices that people might have today. They certainly didn't have the internet, the information choices. And that brings us to the next thing, which is that the country was responding to the whole time in history. You know, I've, I've done a lot of professional trainings. I'm, I'm trained as a nurse. I'm, I'm trained as a psychotherapist and uh, I'm trained as a teacher. I'm also trained as an archeologist. And uh, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in history. And I'm really interested in the fact that if you think back to that time in history where your ancestors, where your family were, uh, the ones who, the people who influenced that parent of yours in that original situation, that time in history had its own limitations and its own challenges. And that may take you back to a time when there was major war. It may take you back to a time when there was famine. It may take, take you back to um, time of of colonial expansion, of empires expanding across the world. You know, as a historian, I, I look at this, historians tend to describe this last few hundred years as, as the kind of age of imperialism. So it's the age when the European civilizations expand across Eurasia and, and across the other continents. And in a sense, we're just coming out of that um, uh, time in history now. So that that time in history has its own beliefs and its own values and, and they control what countries can can even choose to be coping with. So in the same way, of course, that time in history has its own techno technology and its technological limitations. As I said, you, you couldn't Google things on the internet and uh, check what's going on in other places around the world at that time. There were no social media. Um, there was no Telegram or, or um, uh, Facebook. So uh, people did the best that they could with what was available at that time in history. Now that time in history is part of the whole story of humanity. So that's a, the next layer after this is to understand rather than complain about that time in history and say, oh, that was a terrible time. Understand that that's part of the whole story of humanity, of humanity spreading out across the globe, creating civilizations, and then gradually meeting together again and working out who is actually here in the world now and what, what do we do about our different beliefs and our, uh, our different ways of behaving. So it's part of that whole story of humanity. And that humanity, of course, is part of all of life on Earth. Where hu human beings, as they spread across the, the planet, they depend on all the plants and animals that they come across on their way. Uh, they're integrated into that system of life or biosphere, biosphere. And so that, um, that life system that is the planet Earth, that actually is the system around human beings. So it's no use even blaming, well, human beings or humanity, because actually, you know, it's life. There is life around us and our human ancestors were doing the best they could, human population at one time, 
many thousands of years ago dropped to only a couple of thousand people we know from genetics now so they they had a pretty hard time they were struggling to survive and we are part of the story of them recovering from that um, expanding across the globe and working out how to live peacefully together and then we can expand the understanding even further and, and look at it from, from from the entire cosmos understand well this is this is part of some vast story that is around us so that's where we're headed and i hope that gives you a sense of the values behind this the values behind this are that our life is made of systems um, and secondly that people are doing the best that they can at the uh, in the situation that they find themselves with the beliefs and values and inside abilities that they have at that moment and so these are all basic NLP ideas. What's new is the idea that we'll actually face the fact that this means we are part of this global system. And I think that is the most important NLP uh, understanding that we need to have at this moment in history. We are very close, I believe, to the edge of destroying ourselves in more than one way. Uh, so we have a climate crisis that's going on worldwide. Um, we have a, a demonstrated inability to, as a nurse, I would say, we have an inability to effectively respond to plagues. Um, <laughs> people always say in English, we say, if you don't, if you're going to really avoid something, you say, well, I'll avoid it like the plague. But it turned out in the last plague that people don't avoid the plague. They actually rush out into it and feel that it's their right to be out there. Um, catching the plague and passing it on. And so uh, so we, we face a climate crisis, we, we face uh, uh, plagues that are likely to come, and we also face the possibility, the very real possibility in the near future of nuclear war. So rather than pretend that that's not happening or think if I just think nice thoughts, it'll go away, we have, I believe, a responsibility to aim at the collective sources of these crises because we need to cooperate better as human beings on this planet. Otherwise, we won't be here in another 100 years. So that's, that's where this process comes from. I feel very passionate about it. I'm very grateful to my wife, Yulia, for developing this process. I'm very grateful to the universe for providing us these kinds of ideas at, at this crucial time in history. And that's what I want to do with our time together. So as you begin, yep, beginning now, as you begin, my recommendation is that you, having understood where we're headed, you put that aside and relax. And really begin to look inside for what is the first thing that you'd like to, to actually change. And as, as we look for that, one nice thing to do is to check, do you have, do you have a sense of spiritual connection in any way? Do you have a sense of... Uh, some being or person who guides you like um, do you do you have a kind of a shamanic guide do you have a um, do you have a sense of saints who look after you do you have a, a sense that uh, God or Allah um, the supreme the source is uh, is, is guiding you and ask that uh, guiding power to be with you as we do this process because it's not a little thing we're doing we're, we're doing something pretty big and you want it to align with the with the deepest, most precious values that you have. So, so just go inside and, and ask that to be with you. Now, if you're a very rational, scientific person, which is kind of like me, then what you're going to do is you, you're going to ask that rational understanding of, of system structure and of what's necessary to be with you at this time. And then as you relax, just think about this experience you'd like to change, this response of yours, this feeling you'd like to change. And as you do that, I'd like you to estimate from zero to 10, where zero is nothing, and 10 is the worst it could feel. How does it feel when you think about this response right now 
just notice that give, give yourself a number from from zero to ten how unpleasant is this no one's going to ask you what it was so choose something that's important and check how strong is the feeling as we begin this process so you can check at the end what's changed and take a couple of breaths and relax and since you don't feel at peace with this response or this emotion that means that there must be a part inside you that generates this rather than you deciding to do it consciously so what i'd like you to check is in what way does this response parallel a conflict you might have had much much earlier in your life with a parent with a caregiver uh, someone else who was in a position of authority and it may have been that the conflict was between you and them or it may have been that you observed them having this same kind of conflict there you go and as you remember that time notice how old would you have been when that first happened Another way of asking it, how old does this response feel? Does this feel like a five-year-old's response or a seven-year-old, a four-year-old? And so notice what age you would have been when this first was an issue. And as you're aware of that, what I'd like you to do as well is I'd like you to Pay attention to who else was there in that situation, who was that parent or other person. And notice that they brought their own internal limitations into that situation as well. And that contributed to your experience of it. They had their own beliefs, their own values, their own worries that you may not even have known about. You're not blaming them. You're not justifying and excusing them. You're just noticing, and that's how come they did the things they did. And then I'd like you to expand the scope again, wider, and notice the larger extended family around that person, the family they grew up in. Who else was influencing that person, even in that situation? who had influenced them previously in their early life. And what beliefs and values, what stresses did those people cope with? Just notice the unease that might have come from interaction with all those other people in that family. Again, not criticizing them, not excusing them, just noticing. And then expand the scope again even further and notice that that family as well had to cope with their community and notice what was happening in their local community at that time the people they would meet in their workplace the people they would meet when they were going down to the shop in the organizations they belonged to just notice what they were coping with and notice the beliefs and values that that community was built on at that time. Notice the stresses, economic stresses, uncertainties in that community at that time. And then expand the scope even further. Notice the culture that that community was part of. The language, the faith that was most dominant there without criticizing it without justifying it we're just noticing oh yeah that's how come they were responding that way and notice those challenges those limitations that that culture had as well because of its history the way it interacted with other cultures around it the fears it had the resentments it had about things that had happened long ago just noticing 
and then expand the scope beyond that and notice the country the countries even in plural around and just realize what was the country going through at that time who was apparently in charge what stresses were there in the country what was the country trying to do and again we're not criticizing it we're not blaming we're not justifying it we're just noticing how that shaped the responses of even those cultures inside the country and then expand even further and notice that era in history that time in history notice what limitations there were in terms of technology notice what limitations there were in terms of information probably we're thinking before the internet before mass communication notice what choices people had and what choices people didn't have at that time in history notice all the changes that were happening around the world at that time and how your country was responding to those changes protecting itself against other things that were happening in the world at that time and again this is not blaming and it's not excusing it's just noticing the country was responding to this time in history and then expand even further and realize that that time in history is part of this vast story the story of humanity of human beings spreading out across the planet searching for new places to live creating civilizations all across the planet and then trying to connect again finding each other again and working out what do we do and how do we deal with all the differences that we have now part of that vast story of humanity that shapes even that particular time and then expand the scope and realize that as human beings expanded across the world humanity as well was responding to a wider system of life the plants the animals that human beings needed to survive the planet that they needed to live on the climates that they needed to adjust to all of these challenges shape what humanity has done and so now just notice that wider sphere of the of life of the biosphere biosphere and then expand the story even more as you get a sense of life and its beauty and its infinite complexity across this whole planet of all the living beings inside human beings all the living beings that are around that they depend on without even noticing it then expand even further so that you're looking at earth as part of an even larger system as one planet around one star in the vastness of the cosmos with these great star systems galaxies billions of stars billions of planets and as you look at this at this level find whatever word is right for you to describe this level you might think of it as the basic laws of physics you might think of it as energy you might think of it as spirit you might think of it as consciousness that's behind everything you might think of it as light you might think of it as God just be aware of the vastness of this great force that holds the universe in its hands and as you expand your awareness to this cosmic limitlessness allow yourself to melt into that existence yourself going beyond the bounds of physical body experiencing yourself as what you also are one with all it is as the cosmos looking out through your eyes the cosmos looks at itself now through your ears the cosmos listens to its own story 
in your heart the cosmos itself beats and as you experience this more and more fully allow this expanse of awareness to change your understanding of the planet as you look down at that and allow this expanse of awareness to change your understanding your experience of humanity look at humanity as part of this greater story of the cosmos of energy of life and allow this expanse of awareness to change your understanding of human beings of humanity see humanity as another way for the cosmos to look at and learn about itself allow this expansive awareness to transform your understanding of that time in history and that time in this long long story of human beings and allow this expansive awareness to transform your understanding and perception of your country struggled to find its place in that time and history and allow this expansive awareness to transform your understanding of the culture or cultures inside that country the beliefs the ways of doing things the languages and allow this expansive awareness to transform your understanding of that community that you were thinking of Allow this expansive awareness to transform your understanding as well of that family, that wider family that you were thinking of. And then allow this expansive awareness to transform your understanding of even that person, that parent or other person. And notice how this expansive awareness changes your understanding of what they were doing what was happening there even in that original situation when you were so young see it as part of this vast story and allow this expansive awareness to change your understanding of how you responded as a younger you and again since you're not blaming or excuse him there's a quality of compassion that flows out in waves from you across all of this a quality of in the best sense forgiveness and then allow this expansive awareness to change how you understand your responses in the last few days and this time now where you were doing those things feeling those feelings that you didn't want to have and notice what has changed as you think back to this situation now that you were thinking of originally notice how it feels now and check when you rate it again on that scale from 0 to 10 how is the feeling now? And then even if you think of a time in the future when in the past this would have been a challenge, notice. It's different. It's different. And whoever it was that you invited to guide you through this process whether you did that consciously or unconsciously. As you notice how it's changed, you might want to gently thank them now. As you come back to this room that you're in, at this precious moment in time, and understand 
all of those spheres, all of those systems around. And feel the beauty of being alive. Gently come back to being in the room. So thank you for joining me. I'm Richard Bolstad. This is the Transcendence Process, developed by Yulia Kurosheva. May you use it again and again. There are books available on it on Amazon. If you search for the, the word Transcendence, NLP, my name, Yulia's name. And most of all, may we together build this compassion this forgiveness that doesn't excuse what's happening doesn't deny it at the same time doesn't blame one person or one country or one time in history because the healing has to spread through the entire system. I can't do it alone and you can't do it alone. You need me, I need you. We are one story. Go out. Well.